The, uh, you, you may have noticed before a poster like this. Uh, it has become kind of something of a cultural thing right now. Uh, you may have seen a poster similar to this or uh, with a little different flair. This one says, Keep Calm, Carry On. This is the title of today's sermon. We're going to talk about this. Uh, but I also found one that said, Keep Calm and Eat Cookies. Uh, For some of you, that would reflect maybe your mentality. Keep calm and go shopping. I think that, no, no one here shops. Maybe some. Keep calm and use the force. Uh, That would be one that some of you, very quietly, you don't want to admit to it. I understand that. Uh, But Star Wars is something, okay, someone raised their hand. Good for you, sir. All right, so uh, it happens. This poster first showed up in 1939 by the British government. And the British government uh, manufactured this as part of a publication or a publicity campaign, rather, to help the people prepare themselves for what was coming. There was going to be a time where uh, the Germans, they were afraid, would invade. There would certainly be airstrikes, and they wanted to preemptively encourage their people to keep calm, to carry on, to keep calm and keep doing those things that British people do. They were preparing for a conflict. And what what I want to talk about this morning is this understanding that we are in a conflict as well. And these same words that the British government used for their people, we can use in our own life. We need to keep calm and we need to carry on. Christianity and American culture have had a strange relationship over the years. Initially, when America was, was founded or the colonies were founded, in some ways, these went one in the same. The culture within a specific colony or city was Christian. It was a Christian worldview that brought it together and that drove it. But as time went on, as uh, the Enlightenment ensued and other things uh, began to creep their way into American thought, uh, while the Christian worldview remained on the same line and the same way of thinking, culture began to drift ever so slightly away. This happened in the uh, American Revolution, and in time after that, it became more and more apparent that even though the Christian worldview was still prominent in the American landscape, there's been this steady distancing. And today, we live in a culture that is in many ways hostile to the Christian and the gospel worldview. Uh, We've seen this even in the past week where uh, uh, missionaries who were giving of themselves to care for people who were near death in being brought back to our country, are labeled idiots, are called a threat. We see more and more this kind of small-scale suffering, I will call it, a small-scale suffering that exists here in our country because of the Christian worldview. If you object to abortion, if you object object to the use of abortifacients and even certain kinds of birth control, you can be sued and you can be attacked. If you believe in the biblical definition of marriage, you can be made to look like a bigot. If you share your faith and live your faith out publicly, you can be mocked and ridiculed. And and these are difficult things, but what we need to understand before we start here today is that on a global understanding and in a global landscape, this is suffering with a small S, a minuscule S. This is the small-scale kind of suffering for the gospel and the Christian worldview. Because we know that worldwide it's much more difficult. We know the story of Miriam Abraham in the Sudan who was sentenced to death because she became a Christian and just recently was freed. We know about pastors in Iran who are still in jail. We know about Christians in China who are routinely beaten and thrown in jail. And we hear the horrific stories of what is going on even right now to our brothers and sisters in Christ in in Iraq where children are being killed children the ages of my children. And if that is difficult for us to say and to hear, it should be. So we need to understand at the outset that as I'm going to talk about suffering that we might endure in American culture, it is nothing compared to what some people are dealing with. But in saying that, I don't also want to diminish your situation. Because I know that life can be difficult. Life as a Christian can be difficult. Life in your workplace can be difficult. Life in your home can be difficult. Life at school can be difficult. And I don't wish to diminish that difficulty, but it helps to put it in perspective as well and understand that the small-scale suffering that we deal with, while it is suffering, 
is in one sense nothing to be compared to what other people are dealing with. So what we need to do is we need to keep calm in our situation. And we need to carry on. Because we are called to be an influence in our world. We talked last week a little bit about adoption and, and orphan care and how that can be an influence in the world. How we live our lives is an influence in this world. And ultimately, how we suffer can be an influence in this world. So today I want to talk about the kind of suffering uh, that we can encounter as believers simply because we love Jesus and we are trying to influence a fallen world. And to do that, we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's on page 1,295 in your pew Bible. And so I would encourage you to turn there. But we're going to work through <clears throat> this idea of suffering. Now, uh, Peter wrote this letter to a group of Christians who had left Jerusalem. Now, they were either Christians who began their life in Jerusalem and then uh, when Christians were persecuted in the city, they went to other places, or it was uh, a group of, of Jewish Christians that followed the Jewish faith, and then when they came to understand who Christ was, they followed him. So he's writing to these people that are Christian believers, <clears throat> excuse me, that are living in various cities. Now, at this point in time, there is persecution happening to believers, but where Peter is writing to, he tells us at the beginning of, of chapter 1 to the, to the churches that he's writing to, persecution hadn't really reached them yet. There wasn't this kind of martyrdom or attack for their faith, but there was this sense of harassment. Kind of a bubble was brewing, if you will. There was a bubble growing of, of sentiment, angry sentiment, uh, dissatisfaction, uh, curiosity towards Christianity, and at some point this bubble would burst and persecution would take place. After A.D. 70, it becomes widespread. But this is before that. And so Peter is telling them, you're going to suffer in certain circumstances in your life because of Christ. And how you suffer can be an influence to those who still do not know who Jesus is. Remember, we talked a number of weeks ago about understanding that those who don't know Christ are not our enemy. They are not our enemy. That is our mission field. That is who we've been called to. And Peter is saying, in the midst of this, some of these people are going to persecute you. You're going to suffer because of what some of these people do, yet you can be an influence to them. It was difficult for believers at this time socially. They were looked on with suspicion. They worshipped only one God, and everyone in Greek culture knew that there were a number of gods. How can you only worship one? What's more, when these Christians would get together, they would eat of bread and drink wine, and they would say things like, this is, this is Christ's body. This is Christ's blood. These people are weird. They didn't understand them. So persecution would come socially. It would come economically too. In order to get jobs, you had to be part of a guild. It's like an old-time union, but even different because these guilds were centered around not just what they did, but around the various Greek gods. And so Christians began to understand very early that I can't be a part of this guild. And so they would remove themselves from that, and then they would endure persecution because now they couldn't get a job. They're being harassed. And so it's getting difficult for them. It, it's getting hard. They were seen as weird, different, problematic. It was a growing concern. Does this sound like your life? Does this sound like your school, if you're in school, where people think maybe that you're a little off, something doesn't make sense? Does it sound like your family, that when you go to family gatherings, people whisper quietly about the religious nut, and they ask you to pray at dinner and no one else? Does it feel like your workplace, where if you bring up religion, someone tells you to shut up? Does this feel like your life? In some sense, it does, and it should. But what we have to understand is that if we're ready to suffer in these little things, then we will be ready to suffer in big things. Now, I am not this doom and gloom person. Okay? I am not some sort of pessimist or, or even a realist, someone would say. I'm not someone who's going to tell you that by next week they're going to come in with guns and tell us you can't worship. That day may come in this country. I don't think it's tomorrow. I don't think it's next week. I don't think it's next month. I'm not going to pick a day. I'm not one of those preachers. All right? But it will come. So in order to be ready for whenever big suffering comes, whether it's in your lifetime, your children's lifetime, or your grandchildren's lifetime, we have to learn how to suffer well in the little things now. And this passage, I think, can help us. It can help us to keep calm, and it can help us to carry on. So I want to invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter. Stand if you're able. We're going to read this passage together, verses 13 through 17. 
And Peter says this, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Lord, will you add a blessing to the reading of your word this morning? Keep my words clear, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this passage together today, we're going to see six things, which I realize is a lot. I know there's a lot of things on your notes. If I know myself well, we'll spend a lot of time on the first two, and then we'll try and breeze through the last four. All right? I don't know why people laugh at that. We'll start with a question. We'll move to an encouragement. We'll get a little bit of instruction. I'll try and give an application. We'll talk about the result, and then we'll get to the purpose of it all. If that sounds like a lot, it is, but we're going to do it together. The first thing is a question that we get from Peter right at the very beginning. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? That word zealous there implies this kind of fervent devotion. Think rabid fan. You know, we're about to embark upon another football season, which is always exciting here in Detroit. And there are going to be people that you see at various games, whether it's a Lions game or some other game, grown men who have families, jobs, and presumably a life, show up at a game fully decked out in some sort of gear. Uh, look Like if an alien were to come to Earth, they would think, what is this? All right, because they're so invested in this. Some of you are fervent at home. You throw things at a television. You scream like they can hear you. You make people leave. Your wife uh, won't let people over the house when you're watching a game or something like that. There's this fervency, this devotion, this rabidness. Paul is talking about that same kind of mentality, but when it comes to doing good. Not that we decorate ourselves and walk around and, and cheer whenever someone does something good, but to have this zeal for the gospel that we want to live out in our daily life. And so we are zealous about what is good to the point that sometimes people may try and harm us. Now in this description, he kind of gives a rhetorical question. Who is there to to harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Now I think it's rhetorical. Because I think that, that in one sense, the people who are reading this, the first answer they give is, are you, Peter, do you know what's going on here? Have you any clue? I live in a community and everyone around me wants to harm me. Now, I, I, I go to work, and my cubicle is in the middle, and everyone around me, it seems, they want to they dwell on other things. They want to make fun of who I am. There are people out there to harm me. I go to school, and do you understand what the teacher says about Christians? Do you understand what the teacher says about people who believe that the Bible is true? People want to harm me everywhere. In one sense, as these people read, Peter's saying, well, of course there's people there to harm me. There are people all over to harm me in this life. There are people who do not understand the gospel, and because of that, they are hostile to it. They're not the enemy. They are our mission. All right, but they are trying to harm us. I mean, James, or Peter goes on in the next chapter of this to say, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. James talks about various trials. When Paul gives like an outline of his life, he says that he was nearly stoned to death, shipwrecked, beaten, All these guys, if we got them together, they wouldn't say there's no one there to harm you. They would say, of course, there's someone there to harm you. It's going to happen. But on a very deeper level, on the ultimate level, we have to understand that no one, no one, no one can harm you ultimately. No one can harm you ultimately. We will not be harmed in an ultimate sense. Nothing anyone can do can separate us from the grace and the peace, and the love that we enjoy because of the salvation that Peter talks about in the beginning of this book. He tells his people, remember, you've been raised with Christ. You are a part of his church. He has saved you. And because of that, no one can ultimately harm you. Peter tells them that they're his chosen race. He calls them a royal priesthood. He says they're a people of his own possession. And we need to understand that no matter what harm comes upon us in this world, no matter what difficulty we endure, no matter what kind of suffering... No one, no one, no one can ultimately harm us. And when we remind ourselves of this, we will find greater peace. And we will find the power that we need in the situations where we begin to suffer. I grew up in Christian school. 
And then I went, uh, in, for my undergrad, I went to Oakland University. Go Golden Grizzlies. And when I got there, uh, I, I had grown up in a Christian bubble. And I just knew that the day would come where I would have to defend my faith in public. And I was ready for it, I thought. And I remember sitting in one class, it was Shakespeare. And I, when I went to college, I wanted to just take the note. Give me the notes. You know, don't put me in a group with people. I don't want to do projects. I just want to give me the notes. I'll write it down. Give me the exam. That's the kind of learner that I am. And so I was, I was frequently trying to not raise my hand. Questions only lengthen class, right? And so all I want is what you need to give me. And so I'm taking notes, and all of a sudden, it's the Shakespeare class. This professor yells out, where are the Christians? Just yells that out in the middle of class. I'm thinking, oh no, what is happening here? I'm, I'm, I'm a worst case scenario thinker, so my mind's going towards, they're coming for me? I, I don't know what's going to happen here. Uh, are they making us leave? Is this what I read about in that book someone gave me or something? Where are the Christians? And so I think, oh gosh. And you ever hear the Holy Spirit kind of tell you, yes, you have to respond to this. I'm thinking, I could just keep my hand down the Holy Spirit. No, you're probably going to need to do this. Not audibly, but you just feel so I put my hand up. He's like, stand up. I'm like, oh, this just got worse. It's like he's going to flunk me because he doesn't believe in Jesus or something. And then I'm going to fail out of college. I won't get to keep my scholarship. I'll have to move home and live with my parents in their basement, and I'll still be there today, probably with a keep calm and use the forest T-shirt on or something like that. All right? And so that's where my mind goes. So I'm standing up, and he says, tell us about Jonah. You know, because in your mind, as soon as you know you're going to have to say something, you start going through things. So I'm thinking of, you know, the big questions and how can a God allow for suffering and, and, and how can there be evil in the world and still be a God? Could God make a rock so big he couldn't lift? And all these kinds of questions that people throw at you sometimes. And then he says, tell us about Jonah. And I kind of froze. I'm like, uh. He's like, you know Jonah, don't you? Yes, yes, yes. And so I kind of mumbled through the story. I messed up a couple things. I probably integrated Noah into Jonah. I don't know. It was all a blur. And then, and then finally, he's like, thank you, sit down. And I just, I sat down. Somehow, he, he brought Jonah into bear with Shakespeare there. I don't know what he did, but he did it. And in that moment, I remember thinking, as I was about to raise my hand, a lot could go wrong here, but ultimately, nothing can go wrong. In, in the end, this guy has no power over me. And I'm going to have a chance, maybe, to share something about my Lord. And so I stood up. It was very difficult. But I did that. And what we need to understand is that no one can harm us. Someone might harm our grade. You know, someone might do something. But in an ultimate sense, no one can harm us. We may die. We may be persecuted. Bad things might happen. But no one can harm us. And Peter continues then with an encouragement. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. This word, but there, is kind of more like saying, indeed, listen, you're going to suffer. Peter's like, you all know what's coming. We sense what is coming. He says, but suffering is going to come. You're going to suffer for righteousness' sake. And if you do that, you will be blessed. So you hear what Peter's saying. The suffering he's talking about here, rooted in a zeal for the gospel, for our salvation, should not be interpreted as punishment, but it should be understood as an indication of blessing. Now, we need to be careful here for a moment because there's an error that that lies in not understanding this and what what Peter's saying here. If you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. What this infers is that there will be some kind of suffering at times in our lives that will be there for righteousness' sake, that will be some sort of God-ordained, God-purposed suffering. All right, so we can't look at people and swing something way over here and say, listen, you are uh, never going to endure suffering because you know what? God wants you to be prosperous and happy. This idea of the prosperity gospel that says if you, if you have enough faith, life's going to be great for you. How does that work itself out in what we see on TV right now? How do you go to Iraqi parents and tell them if they just had more faith? What a horrible thing to say. So we need to understand that we can't swing this all the way over here and tell people that that because you uh, suffer, you're not doing what's right. Suffering does not equate to punishment in every circumstance. It does not equal punishment in every circumstance. Sometimes we're suffering because we're doing what is right. Sometimes we're suffering for righteousness' sake. God does not always want us to be happy and well off. It's a wonderful passage that comes out of the 
The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe that I may have used before, but I think it paints a picture wonderfully. Uh, as, as they're coming to understand who Aslan is, uh, they, uh, Susan asks, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. And she said, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. And Mr. Beaver responds by saying, safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Our God is good, but it doesn't mean life will be safe. And so we need to throw that aside. Because all we do when we say things like that, like if you have enough faith, everything will be fine, all we do is cheapen the suffering of our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. And we need to stop it. Turn that off on your television. Don't send money to those people. Turn it off. But then we have to swing it over here. We, we, we do not want to, we want to avoid this artificial pursuit of blessing. Don't, don't now think, okay, so blessing will come if I suffer. I need to suffer because I want blessing. We don't go out and seek suffering. Uh, when I was a student pastor, we used to do a trip called the basic trip, and we would go and we would share our faith in the mall. Some malls didn't like that, so they would tell you to leave. Other malls, they were fine with that, and it would be okay. We never really had any kind of real incident except this one time. A group from another church, not our students, please hear me carefully. I did not lead them down this path. All right, went to a certain mall and got on top of a, a table, opened up their, uh, one kid opened up his Bible and started reading just scripture. I don't know what he was reading. He could have been reading Leviticus. Very loudly, just shouting it. And the security came and he took his Bible and started to run through the mall yelling. Now, I'm sure it made for a very funny picture. He came back later and talked about how he had suffered for the gospel. That's not suffering. That's stupid. All right? And we can invite, we can invite stupid suffering on ourselves by using words that we don't have to, by trying to incite anger with people when we're talking about things, by, by saying things like I heard someone on the radio nuke all of them. When you say things like this, uh, you do nothing. It, it's just stupid. All right? We have to suffer well. And that means we suffer for righteousness' sake. So we avoid this, this artificial pursuit of blessing, but we also do not want to miss the encouragement that Peter's giving, which is this, is that we know the blessing will come. We believe that a blessing will come. Now, it doesn't mean that we'll see it on this earth. It doesn't mean that everything is going to go right for us and, and it'll all be tied up in a nice little bow by the time we leave this planet. We may not understand and we may not receive that blessing until heaven, but it will come. We sang this morning that song, I Will Rise, and it's a reminder that ultimately we will experience the blessing of resurrection, of redemption through Christ, and that will be enough. But it is coming. The third thing that we have here from Peter is an instruction. You know, understanding this, understanding this encouragement that we have, he now gives us an instruction. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy. Have no fear, nor be troubled. Now, we will read this, and we, we read right into it and see a uh, surface. Have no fear, nor be troubled. Makes sense. We can apply that very easily. They can't harm you ultimately. There's a blessing coming someday. So we have no fear. We are not troubled. But as the Jewish readers read this, the people that Peter was writing to primarily, as they read this, their mind would have gone back to another prophet that said the same thing. Their mind would go back to Isaiah, who said, Have no fear, nor be troubled. And he wrote that phrase during a time where the people were living under the king Ahaz. And King Ahaz was one of those kings that you read about that did evil in the sight of the Lord. He killed his own children. He sacrificed his children. He used money from the temple to pay off other things. He set up altars to other gods all over the place. He did this stuff. And when they read that, they read, have no fear nor be troubled. Their mind goes back to what Isaiah said to them during that difficult time when they were serving under a king who was evil. And these people that Peter are writing to live in the Roman Empire under an emperor who at some point is going to go basically crazy and seek their death. Peter's saying, have no fear nor be troubled. And there's, there's an implication here. And that first one is that we don't fear. Don't be afraid. It reminds me of, of Matthew 10, 28, where Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We do not fear. Now, of course, we're going to walk through life. I, I don't necessarily think this means 
that we just walk into danger like we're some sort of gospel-centered superhero and you can't harm me ultimately, whatever. We're smart about it. But in the end, we understand that they can't take our life because our life is hidden in Christ. So we have no fear. And we also are not afraid. We cannot be afraid. The positive side of this instruction is that we honor Christ the Lord as holy. We don't fear and we avoid that because what we're doing is we're honoring Christ in the end. This is what we're trying to do in our life. Because if our power is found in something else, we will fear. But if we are honoring Christ the Lord as holy in what we do, then there's no need to fear because we understand him on a deeper level. And our confidence is not in ourselves because it is not in us or through us, but our confidence is in our King who is the Lord, the one who rules, and he is holy. That is where our confidence rests. So our confidence cannot rest in a nation. It cannot rest in a military. It cannot rest in a political party. It cannot rest in a political mindset. It cannot rest in uh, anything other than who God is. That's where our power and our ultimate hope rests. And as that divide continues to grow between culture and the Christian worldview, we have to continually remind ourselves that we are not finding our hope ultimately in anything that is American. We are finding it in who God is. That is where our hope is. Then Peter gives us an application. Always, he says, be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Since we are not afraid and since we pursue the honoring of Christ as we relate to others and share Christ, we will have to make a defense of the hope that we have. Now, the hope that we have is that blessing that we believe will come one day. Why do you suffer the way that you do? People will come and ask you, where do you find this hope? Now, this passage isn't necessarily about physical suffering that you may endure as your body breaks down, but the implication is there. Some of you are suffering because you've reached that point where your body has begun to break down. down. Yet, you have within you a joy. And so people at a doctor's office, in the hospital, uh, at the assisted living place that you're at, look at you and say, why are you so happy? That's an opportunity. When suffering comes upon you at work and you can't get the promotion, you can't get the promotion, you can't get the promotion because they think you're a religious nut. And someone comes and says to you, they've passed you over seven times, yet you still have a smile on your face. Why? That's an opportunity. When you're in school and and someone says something that you disagree with and you raise your hand and you disagree in a kind and honest way with gentleness and respect, and people come to you afterwards and they say, wow, it was cool that you stood up. How how did you have the, the wherewithal or the ability to do that? That is an opportunity. And in every one of those circumstances, let's not be so humble and I shouldn't say humble, but exude this false humility where we say, oh, you know, I don't really want to talk about myself. Don't talk about Jesus. Don't talk about yourself. Because it's an opportunity to not talk about yourself. It's an opportunity to talk about the hope that you have. Now, this assumes, first, that we can articulate the gospel and the reason that we believe it. It assumes that. It doesn't mean that you have to be able to uh, give them all sorts of verses or you have to give them an overview of Scripture or chronologically work work your way all the way through the life of Christ. It means that you need to be able to explain what you believe about Jesus, who he was, what he did, what that means for you. Share it. That's what you need to be able to, to articulate, the gospel and what it is that you believe about that. All right? And, and it also means that we are willing to make a defense. It takes a willing heart just to stand up, just to open your mouth, just to put your hand in the air, just to say something other than, oh, you know, but to start the conversation, that you're willing to do it. Paul talks, I, I, I love this passage because it, it opened my eyes to this understanding of safety versus opportunity. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says this, I will stay in Ephesus, he's talking to the Corinthians, until Pentecost. For a wide door for effective work is open to me. That makes sense. Paul's going to stay there. He's going to articulate the gospel in the situation that he has. He's going to give a defense for what he's going on. But then he says this. An effective door or work is open for me. And there are many adversaries. 
Paul's saying that at the same time, a door for work is open to him. Oh, and he has a lot of adversaries. He's not saying that, uh, you know, I have this and pray that these adversaries are going away. The door is open because the adversaries are there. Sometimes the people that you think are your enemy are actually opening doors for you to influence people through the suffering that we endure. And just because you have adversaries does not mean that you have a... Uh, you do not have a wide door. Paul here is saying the opposite. So we adopt this kind of spiritual warfare mentality that says those are our adversaries. These are the people we will go to with the gospel and we will go to them with a plea that they surrender. And he says we do this with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience. Your conscience should be clear. Gentleness and respect. Some of us need to underline that, circle that, star that. That's something we need to foster in our mind and in our conversations about this. Our goal is not to beat someone in a debate, to yell them down, to be louder than them, to express our anger towards them, to tell them why they're wrong. Our goal is to, in gentleness and respect, lay Christ before them and let them decide. And we need to do that gently and with respect. So some of us, we got to work on that because we're a little gruff. You know? We like to debate. We like to argue. Gentleness and respect. And this defense should have a result. This is what Peter says the result is. So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So that when you are slandered, because that slandering is going to come, those who revile your good behavior, those people that we think of as our adversary, they will revile that behavior, but then they will be put to shame. Now we need to understand this. This is not some sort of promise that if you put your hand up in a school classroom setting, that you're going to out-debate your science teacher. It's not a promise that if you express the gospel at work, that you're going to keep your job or get a promotion. It's none of that. But it is saying that there will be a time and in a place where shame will come upon those who stand against the gospel. A man by the name of Christopher Hitchens reviled Christianity and was one of what's called the New Atheists. He was known for his vitriol and anger, not just uh, a feeling that Christianity was a false idea, but this utter hatred for people who believed it. He died about two years ago. And in this world, he was never put to shame. To my knowledge, he died an avowed atheist, clinging to his beliefs until the end. And so there was no shame for him on this earth. But shame came at some point. Because Scripture says that every knee will bow, every tongue will proclaim that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that will include people like Christopher Hitchens. It will include people who think that you're an idiot. It will be people who um, attack and kill Christians. Children. It will happen to those who stand against Christ. But I want to say this, and we need to understand it. This isn't uh, something we rally around. You know, we don't look... at at, at a science teacher or history teacher for that matter, any teacher or whoever is standing against the gospel and say, you're going to get yours one day. Shame is coming on you. We plead with them. We find no joy in this. We find no joy in eternal shame. We find sadness. We find loss and we find grief. So we have to avoid the mentality of saying, that's fine, you don't agree with me now, but one day you will because we will plea with them until we can't plea any longer. If there's, a, if there's an encouragement that comes out of this, it's that we will not be put to shame ultimately. That while we may be put to shame on this earth, that will not happen in an ultimate sense. And this should love or, or drive us rather to love others all the more, to honor people, to respect people, to defend our home and respect and with respect and gentleness all the more because we do not want them to endure that shame. And then Peter closes this small passage with the reminder of what our purpose is and what the purpose for our suffering is. Peter says, For it is better to suffer for doing good than it should be, than if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. It is better to suffer for doing good. That's an important statement. It is not just better to suffer, it is better to suffer for doing good. We suffer all the time, sometimes because we've done things. Sometimes your marriage has suffered because you haven't done what you're supposed to do. You've suffered at, at your job because you can't get to work on time. That has nothing to do with someone uh, you know, persecuting you for your faith. 
I have children. Sometimes they suffer by sitting in their room all by themselves or by me unhooking media things because they've done something. They, they don't sit up there and go, I'm suffering for doing good. We have to be careful with that. But our suffering that we endure for doing God's will, Peter, Peter tells us that, uh, that, and he leaves that the parenthetical thing out of there you know, because of course it is. We are suffering for God's will. It makes our suffering better than any kind of suffering that you can think of because our suffering has eternal blessings. Our suffering as a result of doing good plays some part in God's unfolding plan for us and for this world. We may never, we may never understand the purpose of what we're going through. There are families who have lost children in other parts of the world, whole families that have been massacred. They do not understand in and of the moment the purpose of their suffering. I don't understand it. I can't communicate it to them. When you read through Scripture, there are people left and right who die with no full understanding of the part that they're going to play in the life of who Jesus is and in the redemption of mankind. I'll give you one example. You think of the man Uriah. His wife was Bathsheba. Uh, David uh, took Bathsheba for himself and had Uriah killed. Uriah has no clue, had no clue here on this earth that God would use his wife to ultimately lead to the line of who Jesus was. He never saw that here. He never saw what his suffering for doing good would, would account for. But he understood that blessing at some point. We may never see this side of heaven our blessing. You may die waiting for it, but we die with hope. And that hope that we die with is understanding that that blessing will come. We may never understand it and may never have our answers, but we have trust and we have hope that God is doing something that is bigger than any of us. And if we're willing to suffer in the little things, we'll be willing to suffer in the big things when they come. A story that has always fascinated me is the story of Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. These were uh, men who were part of the Reformation, and some of you may have heard of them, many of you probably have not. Uh, they were reformers who thought that things needed to change in the church, and that's an understatement. Uh, we exist, the Protestant church exists today in large part because of men like Latimer and Ridley. They held to a Protestant understanding of the gospel that we're saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. This was a dangerous conviction during that time. Many people were punished. Many people were killed. Latimer also preached publicly about his desire that the Bible be translated into English. Now, this was something that a man named William Tyndale had also done, and William Tyndale was burned at the stake for this idea. These were not safe ideas that they had, but these were good ideas. Eventually, Latimer and his friend Nicholas Ridley and others were corralled, and he was very old. And they gave a defense for the hope that they had. And they did it with gentleness and respect. And they did it without fear. And when they were sentenced to death, this is what Latimer said. I thank God most heartily that he hath prolonged my life to this end. That I may in this case glorify God by that kind of death. He's thinking that even in his suffering, he is going to influence others. And he and Ridley are tied to a stake together. It is lit. They are burning and before dying, this is what Latimer says. This is what this old man with deep convictions, an understanding of the gospel, and an understanding of suffering, this is what he says to Ridley. Play the man. Play the man, Master Ridley. We, may, we shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. We are here today in part because of that candle. Latimer understood that his suffering had a purpose. And the ultimate purpose was not his comfort. The ultimate purpose was not his safety. It was not that he would die at a ripe old age with his family around him. That he would be able to retire with a lot of money. That he would have an RV. That he would have a boat. That he would have a cottage. His hope was not that. It was this. That his suffering had a purpose and the ultimate purpose was the glory of God. And this brought him great courage as he endured, knowing that blessing awaited him. And this is my hope for all of us. That when suffering comes, no matter what it may be, whether it is small-scale suffering or it is large-scale suffering, my prayer is that when it comes, we will play the man. That we will play the woman. That as we suffer, we will be aware that God can use our suffering to light a candle. That by His grace in your school in your family, in your workplace, at your church, in your community, will never be put out to His glory. 
That's our prayer. So let us keep calm. Let us carry on. Father, we thank you for this day. And as we prepare to leave here in safety, we are reminded of those who cannot. We are reminded those, of those who are suffering in a large-scale sense. And Lord, you have a plan and a purpose in all of that. And we admit that we don't know what it is. But we pray for provision. We pray for boldness, for courage, for a sense of peace. We pray for peace. May we not forget them. And Lord, as we go about our daily lives and find ourselves concerned with the small sufferings that we have to endure that are large in our minds, I don't want to diminish those, but God, will you remind us that no one, no one, no one can harm us. And that this suffering is not about us. It's not about us receiving a blessing. It's not about us looking good. It's ultimately about you. It's ultimately an opportunity for us to show grace to our community and to influence others for who you are. It's in your name that we pray.